Right, uh, moving swiftly on, uh, the final item of business today is a business is members' business debate on motion number 15085 in the name of Neil Finlay on the need for an inquiry into undercover policing in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And now that everyone has left the chamber, I call on Mr Finlay to open the debate. Mr Finlay, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thanks very much, uh, President Officer. This debate follows a theme of members' debates that, and issues that I've brought before this Parliament. And that's the cle theme of class justice, or more accurately, injustice. And I want to thank members from across the Parliament for supporting the motion and allowing the debate to take place. The issue raised today, I think, gets to the heart of the principles of our criminal justice system. And it asks a key question. Do we have a policing system in this country and a justice system that treats everyone the same, irrespective of your class, your status, your colour, religion your, or your political persuasion? Or do we have one that picks out individuals and groups for special treatment because they challenge the prevailing orthodoxy, the established order, or threaten, even in a tiny way, the grip that those in positions of power have on our economy and our society? If we look over my very young lifetime, we can see numerous instances where vested interests in the media and big business Government, the police and the courts have worked together to quash dissent, control people's behaviour and prevent any challenge to their grip on power. This has been done through anti-trade union legislation, court reform, anti-terror legislation and much, much more. And if you look at cases like those of the Shrewsbury 24, the Camel Laird 37, the 96 Hillsborough fans, the ordinary victims of phone hacking, not the celebrities, the family of Stephen Lawrence, the 95 miners arrested at Orgreave, the 300 Scottish miners arrested at Ravenscraig, the 4,000 blacklisted construction workers, 400 of them Scottish. We can see the state machine conspiring with powerful interests against ordinary working people whose only crime was to defend their jobs, their communities, support their fellow workers or even support their football team. I suspect that in all of these cases, and many more, undercover police officers have been operating with the freedom to do whatever they want, with little control, little accountability, or out with any ethical framework work in which they should be carrying out their activities. And all of this apparently sanctioned by senior officers in the area in which they were operating, and that includes Scotland. And my interest in this stems from my work on blacklisting. We know that the security forces have been involved in political and industrial campaigns going back to the suffragettes and beyond. But in this case, what we had was special branch working hand in glove with the consultant association, not to prevent terrorism or, uh, or potential threats to life, but to infiltrate legitimate democratic trade unions and in collaboration with big construction companies to deny people the right to work. We now know that at least 120 undercover officers have been deployed by the Special Demonstration Squad since its formation in 1968, but only so, so far only 12 have been exposed, half of whom worked in Scotland, the most infamous being Mark Kennedy, deployed here 14 times in his seven-year career. And we know now that they targeted Scottish workers. They targeted environmental activists who campaigned at the G8 in Glen Eagles, one of whom now works for a SNP, an SNP MP. They targeted trade union officials. They targeted at least 10 Labour MPs, including the now leader of the Labour Party. They did not gather evidence for use in court. They amassed intelligence so they could be, people could be monitored, anticipated and disrupted. And these people acted as a law unto themselves. An internal Met report from 2009 said, says they preferred the less bureaucratic approach and directed their operational activity 
without intrusive senior supervision and management. The SDS directed their own operations with significant tactical latitude and minimal organisational, organisational constraints. That's code for they did whatever they like. And their tactics were truly abhorrent. The majority of known officers had long-lasting and intimate relationships with people they spied upon. Three officers engaged in relationships with women in Scotland. This was all part of the strategy. More than one had a child to a woman whilst pretending to be someone else. One victim described it, and I quote, as being like raped by the state. This is the police in our country operating like this. It is outrageous. Officers acted as agent provocateurs, encouraging activists into confrontations and taking key roles in the organisation of events. Kennedy was the transport coordinator for the protests at the G8, whilst Jason, uh, Jason Bishop and Marco Jacobs both drove van loads of activists up from England. Another officer, Lynn Watson, was also at the G8 as part of the Action Medical Team. Now, often officers have since received convictions under their false identity, withholding evidence during court cases, uh, evidence that undermined those very court cases. In either, any other circumstances, this would be perjury and perverting the course of justice. We have now found out that more than 50 convictions have been quashed since this scandal came to light. And what kind of false identity did they take up? Well, for some of them, it was the identity of a dead child. A dead child. This is the police. President officer, police officers, officers, officers operating in our country under the identity of a dead child to victimise people whose only crime is to want a fairer, cleaner and more just society. I don't know about you, but I find that nauseating and utterly corrupt. In response to this being exposed, the UK government has commissioned the Pitchford Inquiry. And can I commend Theresa May on doing so? And that has a remit to inquire into and report on undercover police operations conducted by English and Welsh, Welsh police forces in England and Wales since 1968. Pitchford does not cover Scotland. And when I asked the Cabinet Secretary last year if police were spying on trade union, environmental and political activists in his party and mine, he said, and I quote, I have no idea. Now, this was both uh, astonishing in both its arrogance and its complacency. Then, on the day of the recess, as we all went off for Christmas. He slipped out a letter to the 10 MSPs who had written to him stating that he now wants Pitchford extended to look at the operations that happened in Scotland. President officer, police officers committed a string of human rights abuses against Scottish citizens on Scottish soil. We don't know what arrangements they had with Scottish police forces. We don't know if this arrangement happened uh, in other force areas, uh, nor do we know which campaigns they infiltrated. We don't know which uh, Scots they spied upon. We don't know how many of our citizens were affected. President officer, if this was happening elsewhere, there would be condemnation all round. But it, is, or it has happened under our noses. Now, I, the Cabinet Secretary hasn't appeared for the debate. I find that Sad that he hasn't on such an important issue. But maybe the Minister can confirm that if the Home Secretary refuses to extend the remit of Pitchford to Scotland, then will the Cabinet Secretary instruct a similar judge-led inquiry here? President officer, I, I'm well over time. There's so much more I want to say in this matter, but time doesn't allow, allow it. But this is a scandal. This is an affront to our democracy. We have to expose what went on here in Scotland and we must ensure that nothing like this ever, ever happens again. Thanks very much. <clears throat> we are tight for time. We will probably have to extend, but in the meantime, um,
call on Joanne Lamont to be followed by Rod Campbell. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I commend Neil Finlay on securing this important debate and indeed in his passionate speech arguing for transparency in Scotland in relation to the role of police. And I only wanted to make um, a brief contribution. Um, I instinctively support the police. I recognise their role in keeping our communities safe. And in the past, I have been active both in ensuring the police address issues like domestic violence, violence against women and antisocial behaviour. So I don't come likely to a position which recognises that there is a problem here in relation to policing. And I, but I don't think we can overstate the significance of the revelations about the conduct of the police um, over a long period of time, the impact on confidence in the police and the rights of justice for victims of behaviour that is hard to believe in its audacity and its cruel disregard for those it affected. I just want to add my comments on why I think these issues matter and why the aims of the motion matter and why I think we are entitled to ask the Scottish Government what they are planning to do. Just before Christmas, I had the privilege of attending an event which hosted representatives from the Orgrieve Truth and Justice campaign. These were amazing women outlining their campaign to secure justice for miners and mining communities who were treated disgracefully at Orgrave during the miners' dispute in the 80s. The campaign emphasised the need for truth and justice, the need to know exactly what happened, who gave sanction to what happened, and justice for those who were attacked and maligned. And they spoke particularly powerfully of those who went to their graves unable to clear their names from the um, attacks that were made upon them. Now, I recall the miners' dispute in the 80s as a time, a difficult time, a hard time, but also a time of solidarity, of community, of the kindness of those who sought to support those who were striking to save their industry. But we also know now it was a time where the state moved against a group of workers in an unbelievable and brutal way. At the time, on the TVs, we were showed pitch battles. There were reports of um, attacks, of arrests, and of minors con um, um, with commentary on their violence. But the role of the police in those um, actions, in those events, while there were rumours about their behaviour, were not properly understood, reported, or addressed. And it is to our shame, I believe, that minors were so badly treated and their actions misrepresented. And at their meeting, the Orgreave campaign has highlighted the significance of the impact of what happened in Hillsborough in changing attitudes and opening people's minds to the possibility that the rumours of corrupt behaviour by the police could actually be true. And they believe strongly that because of the expose of the disgraceful behaviour of the police in Hillsborough has created an opportunity for the Orgreave Justice and Truth campaign to secure their aims because it does mean that there is a recognition that some of these rumours weren't just wild imaginings, but were actually true. And we have to salute these women for making that progress, salute those who took on the might of the press and the police in Hillsborough, but recognise there remains a challenge here for us too, why this campaign matters. Such actions by the police, once seen as being inconceivable, are now laid bare. It is essential that in Scotland we understand properly what has been done in our name by the police? Who made the decisions to allow these actions to happen? And when will these people be held to account? If pictures can be extended, then fine. But I do think there's a question about what we explore and understand about what the police have done in Scotland to innocent victims in Scotland in order to understand possibly what we need to address in terms of policing to make sure, again, that our communities can have full confidence in them. This is not about an attack on the role of the police in our community and our society, but is to support the rights of people to ensure that we have a policing regime that is opened up that people can have confidence in. And I do hope the Minister will give um, reassurance that if Pitchford was not to be extended, that the, you will do all you can to make sure that that inquiry is conducted in Scotland. I think people in Scotland would expect nothing less. Many thanks. <clears throat> now call on Rod Campbell to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I begin by recognising the commitment of Neil Finlay to this issue. It's fair to say that the member sometimes pursues a lonely or certainly sometimes unpopular furrow, but certainly on this issue he's highlighted a legitimate area of public concern. 
We know, of course, that the Glen Eagles G8 summit in 2005 was a focus for spying on activists, and that spying seemed to involve uh, divisions or all organizations with a, a relationship to the Metropolitan Police, an organization whose chief constable directly reports to the Home Office and to the Home Secretary. Given these allegations and the fact that we already know that the Metropolitan Police has apologized to women who may have been befriended by undercover operations and indeed the other allegations unearthed by the Ellison Review into circumstances surrounding the investigation into Stephen Lawrence's murder, I believe it's right that the Home Secretary has uh, instigated a judicial inquiry and she should be commended for it. An inquiry, as Mr Finley's motion makes clear, however, is currently restricted to England and Wales. But if metropolitan police officers or their divisions were operating in Scotland, it seems sensible to extend that remit to Scotland. And I await with interest to hear the Minister's comments on the Government's request to the Home Secretary on this point. The Pitchford inquiry, it seems, will extend well beyond the G8. It will involve campaigners on behalf of Stephen Lawrence, as I've already said. And we know it is alleged that Labour MPs, trade unionists and anti-racism groups were also targeted. The extent to which there is a Scottish dimension to this remains to be seen. But if there is credible evidence of this, then I say to Mr Finlay and others, then that evidence should be presented. And it's something that the government should take that on board. Just briefly, yep. Neil Finlay. I mean, there are several court cases. There is a child that's been produced. There is um, evidence from other campaigns. For example, Dame Stella Remington, who became the head of MI5, was on picket lines during the minor strike, not two miles from my house. There is extensive evidence of operations occurring in Scotland, and I hope the member would agree with me that if the, uh, if the uh, Pitchford inquiry is not extended to Scotland, I hope he would support us having our inquiry here. Give you extra time, Mr Campbell. Yeah, no, well, I, I hear what the member says, and, and I reiterate my point about presenting that evidence, but if he lets me finish my speech, you'll hear what I have to say. In relation to what I understand to be 57 convictions which have been quashed to date, however, I'm not aware that any such convictions were obtained in a Scottish court. But it's clearly unacceptable in any democracy where the rule of law is sacrosanct for evidence to be obtained as a result of duplicity on the part of offices of the state, save in carefully monitored circumstances. One of the problems, of course, as I understand it, was because the now defunct National Public Order Intelligence U Unit was engaged in intelligence gathering, and the judiciary did not have the opportunity of reviewing any authorising officer's decision, rationale and justification for deployment because it was classed as intelligence rather than evidence gathering. Procedures have now changed, organisations have changed, and there is now an agreed set of operating procedures. And, of course, we now have a covert human intelligence sources code of practice brought in as a result of the regulation of investigations passed Scotland Act 2000. So things have moved on. And as a result of the HMIC report of 2012, there is now a tighter governance, what is rather unfortunately called uh, domestic extremism. Uh, we know, of course, something about the activities of Mr Kennedy, which formed the background to the 2012 report. What we don't know is how other undercover policing has been operating. Pitchford intends to go back to 1968, to the start of the Special Operations Squad, or as it became known, SDS. It's of course possible that evidence will be uncovered that relates to activity in Scotland since 1968. But today, I'm not aware of any reports which, in some way or other, apart from the, the matters that Mr Finn has referred to, don't relate to the Metropolitan Police. In the absence of that evidence, it seems hard to justify the need for a Scotland-only inquiry. However, in the interests of openness and transparency, I believe the Scottish Government should be open to that possibility, should it arise, and should keep an open mind on the need for an, uh, an independent Scottish inquiry. I believe Mr Finlay was right to raise the issue. We shall have to see how matters develop. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call Dillian Smith, to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, as one of the 10 MSPs who signed the letter referred to by my colleague Neil Finlay, I'm pleased to be participating in the debate tonight and I commend Neil Finlay on securing this debate um, into issues that actually involve an abuse of women that's actually quite difficult to comprehend. And I think when we look at the demand for the Pitchford Inquiry to be extended to Scotland, 
That should never have been a controversial demand in any case. The, the police have already admitted wrongdoing. They've apologised for the damage done to women who've been abused and manipulated as, as a result of undercover officers starting intimate relationships with them. And further, there's been record compensation payouts to women uh, victims as a result of these officers' conduct. But the inquiry, as it stands, will be limited to police activity in England and Wales. The campaign opposing police surveillance, a group investigating the role of undercover police, has documented numerous instances where officers who have been proven to have committed acts of abuse were operating and active in Scotland. There can be no doubt about that. Um, and I am astonished that some members in the chamber still seem to be doubting and questioning that. And despite the apology from the Metropolitan Police about the undercover operations, there is still a lot more to be investigated and revealed about the extent to which these officers were active in Scotland as well as the rest of the UK, not whether they were, but the extent that they were. Now, one of the cases um, in England where undercover officers were found to be active in potentially perverting the course of justice, which has been mentioned previously, was the Stephen Lawrence murder case. And an investigation into that case determined that the Metropolitan Police were institutionally racist. As a result of that inquiry, steps were taken to address the problem, and although there's still some way to go, improvements were made. So if we look at the frequent pattern of male officers abusing their position to exploit women and start sexual relationships, and the implied approval that this would require, uh, the implied approval that this would require from senior officers, then the question is whether or not the police in this regard are institutionally sexist. I think we urgently need a full and comprehensive inquiry into the role of undercover police in Scotland to see if the issue of uh, well actually to, to discuss whether the issue of sexism and abuse of women um, can be openly and honestly addressed. And I would prefer an inquiry in Scotland. And if we have that inquiry, then perhaps uh, the Doughton Thomases can get the concrete evidence, which is there, and it can be put in front of their eyes. Now, presiding officer, the personal experience of the women who were effectively victims of the, the, the police makes for very, very disturbing and distressing reading. Of course, I won't mention individual cases, but in general, the victims began relationships with undercover officers. Um, they often speak about how they genuinely fell in love with these men, sharing every aspect of their lives, personal and physical. Officers would attend family functions and even funerals of the victims' family members. And astonishingly, as Neil Finlay pointed out, in some instances, children were conceived and born um, by undercover officers who never revealed who they really were. And when those officers finally extracted, uh, were extracted or extracted themselves from the operations, they would suddenly disappear at short notice from the women's and their own children's lives under fabricated excuses. They left broken homes and caused huge amounts of distress and heartbreak. That's the real story here. And when it was finally revealed to these women that the men were actually undercover officers, there was untold psychological psychological damage done to the women. Their whole lives were turned upside down by these revelations. One woman speaks of, um, of having been in a relationship with a ghost when she now looks back on the time she spent with him and never really knowing who he actually was. These women's trust and confidence has been shattered. It's left them feeling humiliated, demeaned and violated. And while the victims have stated that no apology or compensation can make up for the abuse they've suffered, we owe it to them to fully investigate and expose these horrific practices. And if we don't fully investigate the role of undercover police in Scotland, we'll not only be letting these women down further, but we'll be potentially risking the health and wellbeing of other women in the future. So we must learn the lessons of these known cases to have any chance of stopping future abuse. Pitchford inquiry should be extended to cover Scotland, but if that is not agreed, then the Scottish Government has a moral duty to undertake its own inquiry into this horrendous practice and provide truth and justice. Many thanks. <clears throat> um, and before I call the next member, I just would let, like the Chamber that let know that due to the number of members wishing to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Uh, I wonder, Mr Finlay, if you'd move such a motion. Yep. Thank you very much. Are we all agreed? The question is, will we extend? We're all agreed. Thank you very much. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Dr Elaine Murray. Four minutes are there by, Ms Mitchell. Uh, I thank Neil Finlay for bringing this debate to the Chamber as it provides the opportunity to explore some compelling issues relating to undercover police operations. The motion refers to the inquiry set up by the UK Government and led by Lord Justice Pitchford. 
His terms of reference announced by Home Secretary Theresa May on 16 July 2015 are to inquire into the report on undercover police operations conducted by English and Welsh police forces in England and Wales since 1968. For the purpose of the inquiry, undercover police operations means the use of a police force of a police officer as a covert human intelligence source within the meaning of section 26.8 of the Regulation Investigation, Investigatory Powers Act 2000, whether before or after the commencement of that act. The terms undercover police officer, undercover policing, undercover police activity should be understood accordingly and includes operations conducted through online media. The inquiry, the inquiry was set up in response to the concerns raised about the activities and conduct of undercover officers operating with the national, within the National Public Order Intelligence Unit and the SDS, the Special Demonstration Squad. We have established that anyone, including Scottish re residents, affected by the activities of undercover officers is entitled to submit evidence. It will then be for the inquiry chairman and the council to the inquiry to review the evidence and decide on its admissibility. And I also note the request to extend the inquiry's remit to include Scotland. By way of background, the SDS was formed in 1968 and based inside the Metropolitan Police Special Branch, which focuses on national security. And at a time of terrorist threats and heightened security, there clearly remains a requirement for undercover officers. However, it is the revelations about the activities of certain undercover officers which has prompted the inquiry, which covers three broad areas. The first establishes what happened, the motivation for, the scope of, the undercover police activities in practice and their effect upon individuals in particular and the public in general, and the role of, and the contribution undercover of uh, policing makes towards prevention and detection of crime. The second investigates systems and procedures, governance and oversight of undercover policing, and the adequ adequacy of justification or authorisation. It covers the selection, training, management and care of undercover police officers and the statutory policy and judicial regulation of undercover policing and will explore the state of awareness of undercover policing within HM government. The third looks to the future and will take evidence from a variety of witnesses, including expert witnesses, about the future of undercover policing and associated matters with a view to informing recommendations. The estimated publication date of a written report and recommendations is summer 2018. This is clearly, therefore, a thorough and meticulous meticulous inquiry. So while I, whilst I have sympathy with the intent behind Neil Finlay's call for a Scottish inquiry, I consider this to be premature, especially given the ability of those residing in Scotland to submit evidence to the Pitchford inquiry and the, the request to extend the remit to Scotland. Presiding officer, undercover police officers, yes, if, if, the, if I have time, I'm on my four minutes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Neil Finlay. The comment that she makes is fine, but it does not extend to operations in Scotland. That is the problem. They can supply evidence, but they're not investigating what happened in Scotland. That's the issue. Yes, well, I understand you. that, and I think that's where we're looking at the admissibility, how that will be treated and how that will affect the inquiry and perhaps um, lead to a decision to extend the inquiry. These are all things that are unknowns just now, but will be uh, explored and decided as the inquiry progresses. Presiding officer, undercover police officers hold a position of privilege and carry out duties essential to the safety and security of the public. And it is deeply concerning. Some undercover officers have strayed so far outside the framework within which they were authorised to operate. If, therefore, the findings of the inquiry to, uh, prove to be unsatisfactory in relation to the activities that occurred in Scotland, in particular at the G8 summit in Glen Eagles, the matter could and should be reconsidered. In the meantime, at the very least, I would expect is Police Scotland to monitor 
closely developments in England and Wales with a view to looking or taking on board any lessons learned from this process. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I now call on Dr Elaine Murray to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I too congratulate Neil Finlay for bringing this important matter to the Chamber for debate this evening. I am not surprised to learn, for reasons which I will elaborate on shortly, that undercover police operations were being conducted by police forces in England since 1968. What shocks me, however, is that these operations were still ongoing in the 21st century and that they have been happening in Scotland. Um, the reason I'm not surprised is that I, a long time back, 37 years ago almost, uh, observed an undercover agent at work uh, when I lived and worked in the south of England and I was there between 1976 and 1989 and as people of my vintage may remember in the end of the 1970s the National Front emerged as a significant political threat in parts of England and stood many candidates at the general and council elections in 1979. The Anti-Nazi League of which I was a member, I was also a young and idealistic member of the SWP at the time, uh, was set up in 1977 in opposition to the rise of the NF and regularly demonstrated against NF marches and meetings. On the 21st of April 1979, the National Front marched through the streets of Leicester, where they were hopeful of electoral success, both in the general election and the local elections, uh, which coincided with it and the anti-Nazi League, as was its habit, arranged a counter-demonstration. This actually was the day before Blair Peach was killed by an officer of the Met at a similar demonstration in Southall. And after what I saw in Leicester, I, I wasn't surprised that somebody had lost their life. Now, apart from being hit by a brick, which actually may have been thought by, thrown by somebody on our own side with poor aim, although the story on the bus which brought you drinks that was thrown by somebody else. I uh, still have a vivid re recollection of one man, so vivid in fact I could actually almost now still describe what this man looked like. He was casually dressed, he was towards but not at the front of a large group of demonstrators, uh, and he was very vocal, he was shouting encouragement to the demonstrators, telling them to attack the, the police. Uh, and try to reach the National Front marchers. Of course, under the circumstances, tempers flared, the demonstrators attacked and were subsequently pursued by police dogs and horses. Now, as my left arm was by this point in a sling formed from a comrade's belt, and I wished to avoid further injury, I hung, hung back from the crowd to observe what was happening. Uh, and as the dogs and horses dispersed the demonstrators and the police arrested those that they could get hold of, the man that had been doing all the shouting gradually retreated further and further back in the crowd and eventually out of it. And then he calmly got into the, back, into the front of a police van. Uh, not in the back, he wasn't in cuffs, he voluntarily got in the front. He was clearly an undercover officer and indeed an agent provocateur and I actually tried to shout out to people to say what he was but under all the, the noise and so on that was going on at the time nobody could really hear what anyone was saying. But I wasn't actually surprised by that back then because the police in England actually had a bad reputation as far as people on the left of politics were concerned, uh, as uh, has already been alluded to by Joanne Lamont. Most of us will remember the scenes from the miners' strike uh, in 1984. And it certainly wasn't just Mrs Thatcher who believed that the left and trade unions were the enemy within at that time. However, it does appall me that spying and undercover activity has been ongoing in Scotland and that only 10 years ago, environmental activists wishing to make their views known. Uh, yes, certainly. Dear Finlay. You know, we, we know this, and, and, and I think what she's uh, told us is really helpful in this and her experience. But when we see senior people from the security services who went on to very high levels, the, the director general of MI5, having been on picket lines in Scotland, surely that tells us that these operations were extensive here at that time. It certainly Murray. raises a, a, a large number of questions as to what was going on. And the fact that it was as recent as that actually shocks me that, that uh, people, not terrorists, environmentalists, were being treated as if they were enemies of the state. And worst of all, that female activists were being deceived into sexual and emotional relationships with undercover agents. I feel that is a terrible violation of their human rights. And they could be considered to have been raped as they thought they were having sexual relationships uh, with somebody very different. I do wonder if prosecution of the agents involved could have happened, uh, could actually be considered. Presenting officer, I'm sure that the vast majority of police officers serving in Scotland will be as outraged by these activities as we are. We don't only owe it to the victims of these undercover police spies to get to the truth of what happened here in Scotland. We also owe it to the thousands and thousands of hard-working police officers who are filling their duties to keep us safe 
working day, day in, day out to look after their communities, because this could stain them by association if the truth remains unexposed. And I hope that the Scottish, the Scottish Government agrees with me on that. Thanks so much. <clears throat> and I call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Hugh Henry. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I too congratulate Neil Finlay on securing this debate. The issue is something he has pursued with vigour. Um, from the outset, I hope we can all agree that the issue that we are discussing today is an extremely important one. The allegations that have been made against the police officers in question are serious. We've heard them earlier, using the identities of dead children um, for their cover without discussing this with their parents, spying on the parents of a teenager viciously attacked and stabbed by a group of youth in a racially motivated attack, and engaging in sexual relations with female environmental and political activists, and in some cases forming long-term relationships and fathering children. The revelations have resulted in serious emotional trauma for those duped by the officers. The Professor of Criminology, Ian Loader, has written in a quote that <clears throat> every police-public interaction is a teachable moment, an occasion in which something is necessarily communicated about the law and the legal authorities and what they stand for. And that something can have fateful, either positive or negative consequences, for people's future willingness to trust and cooperate with the police and for whether they think of the law as worthy of their compliance because it represents moral values which they share. End quotes. The police-public interaction in these circumstances has shocked us all. It is the kind of behaviour that transgresses professional and moral boundaries and flies in the face of common decency. It is, in fact, the kind of behaviour that threatens the very legitimacy of policing. We know that undercover officers were also allowed to operate in Scotland. For example, we've heard of reports that they infiltrated protesters at the G8 summit at Glen Eagles. So even if the officers were from police forces in England and Wales, it appears that authorisation to work in Scotland came from senior Scottish officers. And that's why I support the call for the Scottish Government to hold a similar inquiry. The Scottish Government has acknowledged that its support of a widening the Pitchford inquiry to include activities in Scotland, but doesn't believe there should be a separate Scottish inquiry. Well, the terms of reference of the Pitchford inquiry have been established and its work has already begun. It's unfortunate that the remit does not include the activities of undercover officers in Scotland, but I suspect it's unlikely to change its remit now. So unless the SNP government is arguing that unearthing what has gone on in Scotland, both in terms of English officers operating here and of undercover policing within Scottish forces, is of no importance, there needs to be an inquiry here in Scotland, otherwise Scottish people will be shortchanged. We too deserve to know the scale of the operations carried out and the lines of accountability and authorisation. And we have certainly no room for complacency given the recent revelation about Police Scotland spying and breaches of interception of communication orders. Citizens are entitled to expect the highest standards of policing and rightly expect that there should be clear justification and authorisation of any clandestine policing. And equally, those officers engaged in undercover policing should be carefully regulated and trained and regularly assessed. Can we guarantee that has always been in place in Scotland? Is it in place now? We don't know. And that's why an open and unflinching examination of the extent of undercover policing, past and present, and its governance and oversight here in Scotland is necessary to learn lessons and establish clear terms of engagement. And I support Neil Finlay's motion. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now call on Hugh Henry to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I want to congratulate Neil Finlay not only for bringing this uh, motion for debate here in the Parliament, but also for his not just passionate but comprehensive and analytical uh, setting out of what, frankly, is a horrific catalogue of abuse by the state in this country. It's unacceptable. And frankly, if we in our complacency tolerate it or refuse to properly investigate then we are also complicit with it. Now, we owe it not just to ourselves, to those that we represent, but also to future generations to know that living in a democracy means that there are safeguards, that there is protection, and that there are rules that everyone must follow. I was watching the Minister um, during Neil Finlay's contribution, and he appeared to be surprised, maybe a bit cynical, about Neil Finlay's uh, comment 
that uh, one of the victims is now working for an SNP parliamentarian. I think it would be well, well just let me finish, Minister, please, uh, President Officer. Um, it would be well worth the Minister uh, finding out who that is, speaking to that individual, because she has a wealth of knowledge. And if you know, he won't accept what Neil Finlay and others are saying, um, at the very least, speaking to her would help matters. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I, I, I take the member's uh, points, but however, I would just point out to my disbelief was the nature of the openness with which these such matters are being discussed in a member's debate in this parliament. I appreciate this, this, this sensitivity of the subject and the importance of it to Mr Finlay um, but the, and indeed other members across the chamber, but I just was concerned about being careful that we're not naming people inappropriately who've got no opportunity to defend themselves in this place. Well, Sir well, Henry. So, so, no, can I just finish this point? And if you still need to come in, then you can. But um, that individual uh, openly came to a meeting in the parliament organised by an MSP, publicly contributed to the discussion, to the debate, has no problem in being identified. So I don't think there are any uh, confidences being betrayed or there's any uh, erring uh, or, or on, the, on the wrong side. Not, not, not just now, thank you. I want to make some progress. Margaret Mitchell made the point, and I, I welcome some of the, the, the comments made by Margaret Mitchell, but I think Alison McInnes actually touched on the fundamental issue here. And that is, it's not just about providing additional information to Pitchford. It's not just about saying, look, here are some things in Scotland that we would like you to look at. Because the terms of reference have already been established, there is a limit to what that inquiry can do. And I welcome the belated action by the Scottish Government to write to ask for the, the, the inquiry to be extended. But unless we get a guarantee that it will be comprehensive, it will be all-encompassing, and that the terms of reference will also include things which have gone on in Scotland over the years to make it a genuine UK inquiry, that unless that's done, we are being shortchanged, and therefore we will need our own inquiry. Because some of the things that have been touched on, as I said before, are frankly unacceptable in a democracy, and we need to do something uh, about that. Now, the new Chief Constable uh, of Police Scotland has an ideal opportunity, coming in fresh to the job, to work with Scottish ministers, to look at what, what has been going on. Now, he, he is uniquely qualified in some respects because part of his responsibility when he worked uh, in England was for special branch uh, and, and for those that Special Branch worked with, for the units that Neil Finlay and others mentioned. Now, I don't know if those interviewing the new Chief Constable asked them about those activities or asked them for any assurances and guarantees, but what they at the least now should do, in, in, um, you know, as the accountable body uh, for the police, along with the ministers, is tap in to the, the new Chief Constable's knowledge to find out what he knows about unacceptable things that are going on here, so that that can help to shape any terms of reference for what might uh, happen here. Now, Joanne Lamont was right to say, we need to know what was done. N no thanks, I, I need to make some time. You know, it's not just some of the things that historically Neil Finlay uh, mentioned that you know, I and others were involved in. In the recent referendum, were any of these people involved in either side of the referendum, either in prov you know, provoking votes for yes or for no, and trying to inflame matters? You know, because if they get involved, not in issues of national security, and Joanne Lamont is right, we support the police, but many police officers are, are, are disturbed by some of the things that go on, because this is not about national security. This is about protecting the interests of big business or the interests of certain political uh, views. So were any of these people involved in the referendum campaign, we should be told whether people were trying to stir things up in the way that uh, Elaine, Smith, uh, sorry, Elaine Murray uh, mentioned earlier on. This is the one opportunity that we have to put things right. We know that wrong has been done over many years in Scotland as well as in the rest of the United Kingdom. And if we fail to take the opportunity now to get to the bottom of what was done and put things right, then we are letting Scotland down, we are letting future generations down, but frankly, we are also letting ourselves down as individuals.
Thanks very much. <clears throat> now call on uh, John Finney, after which we'll move to the closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I too congratulate my colleague Neil Finlay, not just for this motion, but for his tenacity, as others have said, in relation to a number of issues. Neil, like many in here, wishes to protect hard fought for workers' rights. He wishes to protect the right to peaceful protest. And uh, like many, he's concerned that the full force of the, the, the state was visited on the minor strike and all the, the, the challenges that brought. Uh, where, where I would want to qualify something that uh, Mr. Finlay said, he said, This is the police. Well, I would say this is an attack on the police, and it's an attack on the police by the state. As many will know, I, I was a police officer for 30 years. Um, the duty, the sworn duty, was to guard, watch, and patrol to protect life and property. You know, uniformed officers play an important visible reassurance to the public with that. There is a role for plainclothes officers, clearly, and, and there is an impo important role also on occasions for undercover officers, but all to reassure and protect the public, of course. Neil Finlay. Allow me to clarify that. It, it, you know, the police who I know in my community, many of them I know, do a fantastic job and have a very good working relationship with them. This is the type of thing that undermines confidence in the police, and I'm sure that the officers that you served with would be as appalled by this as I am. John Finney. Indeed, they are, and you need only go to my Facebook page to, 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 to see that. I have to say my experience is that officers were entirely male, well motivated, and it was to catch the bad guys. And, uh, but it's important that it was the courts who decided who the bad guys were. And the problems that have associated itself with it, various constabularies have come when the police have wanted to act as judge and jury. Now, um, there are uh, issues about the security services. I've raised them in this uh, in, in, in committee here. I have to say... And, and had some astonishing responses to that. Um, I can't envisage any officer returning home from work to say, um, to explain that they'd infiltrated, a, 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 perhaps they might say I infiltrated a, a, a legitimate protest group, to say that they had relations. And I think it's important to use the words that the woman used, that she felt she'd been raped by the state. I think that's the level, the level of uh, language that's appropriate in this instance. And the disgusting thing of taking the identity of a dead child. Now, officers I served with, uh, they, they were appalled by that sickening behaviour. The worrying thing is that's not a rogue individual. That is not a rogue in individual. Uh, that must have been known uh, to, to officers, uh, uh, supervisory officers. Now, they did one of two things. They either ignored it or they're unaware of it. Either way, they were negligent. And uh, uh, who are they? Who were they? Indeed, do we have one in our midst in the form of our new uh, Chief Constable? People will be aware of the, the coverage of that. Certainly having a responsibility, as Mr Henry quite rightly points out, having a responsibility, um, a, a supervisory responsibility for the avoidance of some of the, the smiling that's going on, uh, the uh, supervisory responsibility in a role of special branch, then it's inconceivable that they wouldn't have some knowledge he could share. Now, I'm, I'm surprised, given Mr Campbell shares a membership of the Justice Committee with, with me, would say things have moved on. As my colleague Alison uh, McInnes had said, we at the moment are dealing with concerns, deep-held public concerns about intrusion of privacy. Uh, and, uh, um, the, 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 the motion talks about the opportunity afforded to victims in England and Wales. Well, what about uh, victims in Scotland? Uh, I won't go into the, the G8 protests, but to, to assume that the monitoring that went on across Europe suddenly stopped at Gretna is naive, blissfully naive. It either continued or was handed on one way or another. Um, it, it, it certainly took place. I attended G8 in our capacity of looking after the welfare of officers. But it's also true to say there are some nasty folk out there, and there are some nasty folk that need looked after. But there are legitimate ways that that's done, and it is about the supervisory and the scrutinising that needs to go on. Um, I have to tell you, I, I'm surprised and deeply disappointed by the Scottish Government's response to this. I'm dis surprised and disappointed by my colleagues' response to this. If the level of attendance here, and I'm sure there are some many compelling meetings elsewhere in this building tonight, but if this is the level of interest, then it's, it's disappointing, and I think people would perhaps expect a greater level of interest. Um, Scotland has a separate legal system. It has a separate police system. Um, and the power of constable, of, of someone to act in the power of constable of Scotland, is something that should be absolutely richly uh, 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 regarded and held in, in some esteem. Now, uniquely, the Scottish Government seem keen to cede any involvement in this, belatedly, to the UK Government. I find that strange, to allow control, to allow UK intrusion, if you like, inviting a Tory-inspired inquiry to deal with something 
that clearly there is evidence that should give rise to. It's simply not good, good enough. Um, pernicious forces were at work. Uh, I fear they may still be at, at, at work. Um, I, th I think if the Minister wants to provide reassurance, and I think this is a very good time, given a new, uh, a new Chief Constable being in place, and given all the difficulties that we've had, the way to do that isn't to try and piggyback, possibly in the knowledge that you're going to get a knockback anyway, not to piggyback an England and Wales, but to acknowledge that there are problems in Scotland and address these problems by putting in place a proper inquiry. I'm sure you'll get su uh, support across the Chamber if you do that. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, a late bid from Sandra before we move to the Minister. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, for taking the late bid. Uh, I wasn't intended to speak. I, I thought I would listen. I didn't know too much about the background. have been involved in various issues, particularly with uh, working along with uh, anti-racist groups where we've had to uh, report to the police and have been concerned with that. And uh, what I was intervening, and you actually raised it yourself, uh, Hugh Henry, was the fact of perhaps a referendum and the minor strike. And obviously I've known Hugh Henry for a long number of years away back in the Renfrewshire Council days and uh, the militant faction and... But I wasn't involved in it enough, but you know, I just that was the reason I, I wanted to, to intervene on Hugh Henry in that respect. But there are some things that have concerned me uh, in, in regards to, and, and John Finney uh, mentioned it there about the chief constable and people, and the impression that for some reason or other these people are doing underhand things, and that that's why I, I, I was concerned about presiding officer, and that's why I raised it. Absolutely. I, I'm very grateful for Member Tate. I, I'm not making any assertions about anything. I think it's been rightly pointed out by Mr Henry that there's an excellent opportunity afforded us by the arrival of a new, new Chief Constable who may have some knowledge to share that knowledge with us. And that may well put a lot of our concerns to, to, to rest. I suspect it won't, but it's an opportunity. Sandra, I, I, thank, I thank the John Finney for coming in there because the very word he used, which is a word that hasn't been used at all, was may. Now, I'm not sticking up for anybody, but I'm looking at the letter of the law and I'm looking at sub judice uh, and various other issues. And if you use the letter uh, may, say the word may or is in here, alleges, yeah, you can say these words, but some of the words that's been bandied about in this debate certainly hasn't. No, sorry, sorry, uh, Mr. Finlay. I mean, you can come in if you want. I don't mind. But basically, base, base, well, if, if you let me finish this particular point, you, the motion you put in, it says allegedly, and that's absolutely fine. But other people have mentioned and not said allegedly or may. They've actually assumed, and, and this assumption from some of the contributions has been that these people knew about underhand things that were going on. And I couldn't be party to that, and I don't think this parliament could be party to it either. But I'm all for looking. I'm all for an inquiry. And Hugh Henry, and another one where I wanted to intervene as well, brought up one of the issues I wanted to mention. And that was the referendum. And the way back even in six... Sorry, can I just finish this point? Uh, because it obviously was set up in 1968. That was under a Labour government. Now, 68, then on to 79, when we had a, a first referendum. I'd be interested in see if we can get anything out of that as well. And that was one of the other reasons I wanted to intervene in Hugh Henry. So I'm glad I've been able to say that. If I may, can, can I take an intervention, President Officer? Yes. I, I mean, I, I'm gen genuine curiosity what she's actually referring to when she says that people in the debate have said things inappropriate. If you could pinpoint where that is, I would come back if it, if it was anything I said. Can we just to endeavour to keep off that? issues that might be subject to say, I don't feel that you necessarily need to respond to that. Much Thank quite. you, Zain. It certainly wasn't anything that, uh, if I recollect, which Mr Finney said, but I'm sure we'll look at the, the report and we'll be able to see it there. But can I, can I just reiterate the fact that I, I'm all for an inquiry. I'm all for whether it's, it's extended from Westminster to Scotland, where we have our own inquiry. I don't know what the, the minister is going to say, uh, but I'm all for an inquiry, because I want to find out. This was set up in 1968. We had various things happening, the minor strike, anti-racism. Elaine Murray had mentioned the fact about the rise of the National Front as well. Lots of things that I certainly had, you know, concerns about in, in regarding policing, and I'd like answers as well. But if I could just perhaps uh, you know, look at the, the time scale as well, 1960, it's now disbanded. Uh, how far ahead would we be getting in this time scale? And if we do ask them to look at it or we set up our own inquiry, will lots of things come out, I would hope, in regards to 
uh, infiltrators or, or you know, MI5 or anything else, not just what happened in 1968 or 79 or 80, but more up to date, in fact, in that respect. But thank you so much for indulging me uh, coming in as a latecomer. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, you just told me I'm finished. Taking everybody today. On you go. Oh, right, on you go. I just wanted to thank the White Presiding Officer to clarify that she does accept that apologies have been issued and compensation has been paid to women who were in this situation. And that is not getting into matters of sub judice. We're not mentioning the individual cases. Sandra White. Thank you very much. I recognise that, and that's not to do with the sub judice that I'm talking about. I recognise that fact. Uh, lots of you know, the compensation has been paid out. What I mentioned was the fact that, and if you look at the, the report, you can look at it, you know, and I'll have a look at it as well, but I certainly was a bit uncomfortable with some of the language that was used by some of the con contributors. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thanks very much. And we now move to the closing, closing speech from the Minister. Uh, Minister, you have seven minutes or thereby. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank members for their contributions, in which I fully acknowledge uh, is a very important, very sensitive subject, and clearly, uh, as members have outlined, um, the impacts on individuals are, in some cases, uh, very significant indeed, and I, I fully acknowledge that potentially that's the case. Uh, a number of very valid and constructive points have been made. But, and I do recognise and very much value the, 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 the concern that people have expressed in the Chamber about the, uh, ensuring the legitimate protest can take place unmolested, uh, where they are complying with the law of the land and entirely lawful. I think it's, it's, it's obviously a concern we'd all share if that has been subverted. But I'm sure it will not have escaped members' attention uh, that while the Scottish Government is accountable to this Parliament for policing, uh, by Police Scotland. It, it is uh, not the Scottish Government or indeed this Parliament's responsibility for activities of Metropolitan Police Service or its specialist units. I'm not trying to get away from the nature of the importance of the issue, but I'm just stressing for the point of fact um, that the, these units are not accountable to the Scottish Parliament. It is the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime. If I can maybe just develop a point, I'll bring in Mr Finlay. Um, the, the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, Stephen Greenhall, uh, who hold the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police to account. And it is the Home Secretary who is responsible to the Westminster Parliament for Policing in England and Wales, and who in March announced the Pitchford Inquiry into undercover policing. I'll, I'll bring Mr Finlay in. Me. Thanks, to, thanks to the Minister. Um, uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of yeah, Constabulary Report in 2012 called a review of national police units uh, which provide uh, intelligence on I'm struggling to read my writing here on um, uh, activity associated with protest. That's the name of the report. Said, although Mark Kennedy worked for a national unit, his undercover activities were authorised in bold by senior officers from the police force area in which he was working. That clearly states that if he was operating in Scotland, authorisation was given here. Minister, I, I appreciate that's a statement that, that Mr Finlay has uh, made there uh, in relation to, to a point made by another individual. Um, but I just want to point out that we're not aware of um, the evidence that uh, Scottish officer, officers have authorised it. Indeed, that would be something we would hope... Mr Finlay, I need to develop my point. Uh, can I please finish the point uh, and I'll bring in Mr Finlay. Um, we're not aware of that. An English authorisation, uh, in, in respect, this addresses the point Alison McInnes also made in respect to uh, the point about uh, of officers in these units being authorised by senior Scottish police. We're not aware of that, as I say. An English authorisation, made, if I can use that term, made under RIPA, not RIPSA, would most likely have been put in place in that scenario. So I'll bring in Mr Finlay now, presiding officer. Minister, he's been very good with his time. Um, I received that response in a parliamentary answer uh, from the Minister. Now, can I refer the Minister to this Her, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary report that you can find online and that the Minister looks at this and assesses what has been said by the Inspectorate and comes back to me and members of this Parliament with a response to that point because it clearly states within that report that the authority was given by senior officers in the area in which these people were operating. Now, there's a clear difference between what the Minister is saying and what that report is saying. This Parliament has to know what the facts are on this. Will the Minister come back on that? Minister, if I point out uh, two things, Presiding Officer. One, uh, I'm not responsible for the answer that Mr Finlay refers to that I believe would have been from the Cabinet Secretary rather than myself. 
Um, but uh, just, to correct, just to correct the record, however, the, the point that Mr Finlay is, is making, uh, there is no reference, specific reference to Scotland. That is only the point I am saying. Appreciate the point Mr. Finlay is making, but we do not yet know uh, whether Scottish officers did authorise the operation. Indeed, that is what, something we would hope would be covered by the extension of the Pitchford inquiry to Scotland. Uh, I really need, do need to make progress. Apologies to, to Ms. Lamont. Can I make some further progress? And I'll, I'll President officer, will I have additional time? You have to decide, Mr. Wheelhouse, whether I'm, you're taking the intervention I'm, I'm or not. I'm very short in time. I apologise to Ms. Lamont. If I can, I will bring her back in uh, as if I make some progress uh, first, if I may. Uh, this is an important matter, so I do need to, to, to put stuff on the record. I trust that Mr. Finlay is pursuing the Home Secretary and indeed the Mayor of London with a similar vigour as he has shown in his pursuit of this matter with the Scottish Government. That's not to be flippant, but it's a factual point again because the importance of the lines of accountability for the, the units that, that are uh, affected by uh, the, the point. Uh, I really must make progress, Presiding Officer. I apologise to members. I will try and bring them in later if I can make some progress. Uh, this, um, th there was much a focus in Mr Finlay's uh, speech on, on uh, criticism of the Scottish Government, but I would encourage him to encourage Ms May to extend the inquiry to include uh, Scotland in that. Notwithstanding that, if officers attach those units... <sighs> Of order, Mr. So, you know, I wonder if you can help me out. We seem to be in a unique position where the Scottish Government, where there has been encroachment on their patch by the UK Government, and they're for once saying, this is nothing to do with us, Gov. Go and see Boris Johnson or go and see or whoever the bloody Mary London is these days. I mean, this is bizarre what's going on here today, President Officer. I wonder if you can ask the Minister to clarify. Uh, Mr Finlay, as you will know, that is not a point of order. Uh, the Minister's words are a matter for him, not for me. I, I now invite the Minister to continue. But thank you for raising the point of order, but it is not a point of order. Mr Wheelhouse, please continue. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as I say, notwithstanding the point I have just made, if officers attached to those units were active in Scotland and the inquiry has been set up specifically to look at related activity, then the inquiry should, we believe, strongly believe, be able to consider that activity irrespective of where it took place. That is why the Cabinet Secretary for Justice wrote to the Home Secretary on 10 December last year asking her to confirm that the inquiry would be able to take account of any activity by the Metropolitan Police units that took place in Scotland. And, uh, to date, I informed the Parliament, as of 10 to 5 when I came down to the Chamber, we had not yet received any response from Ms May. But we, we are hopeful of a response, of course. We are not and must never be complacent about these matters, and I do recognise members' concerns. Uh, my, my own colleague Sandra White and, and Roderick Campbell, even in my own benches, have made the point we are concerned about the nature of the activities that may have been, been uh, conducted in Scotland. But undercovering policing is a legitimate policing tactic, as Mr Finney has said. Uh, I really must, presiding officer, progress in my, my comments, if I may. Um, yes, but it can intrude on in privacy and must always be subject to the most robust procedures and rigorous oversight to prevent the harms to individuals that members have referred to. It is our belief that the use of undercover officers by Scottish police is very different to the allegations that have caused such concern and attracted so much media attention. Nevertheless, we have put in place measures to strengthen the control of under undercover officer deployment. Police, please, Scotland. Presiding officer, I've made clear I have to make progress unless I have extra time. You can intervention if you want, because it's an extraordinary sort of evening and we're allowing extra oh. time. So, Thank you for your patience, Presiding Officer. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Finlay. When he says that the, uh, the, the, the Scottish Police act differently from what has happened here, that may be true, and I hope it is. But what evidence does the Minister have of that? Mr. White has. If Mr. Finlay would allow me to develop my speech, Presiding Officer, I am trying to establish the, the, the point that he is referring to. But I am not making reference to the allegations of Metropolitan Police Unit. I am talking about undercover operations of Scottish Police in general in Scotland to, to address Mr. Finlay's concern. Nevertheless, we have put in place measures, as I say, to strengthen the control of undercover, undercover officer deployment by Police Scotland. And I hope that will be of some reassurance to Elaine Smith, Joanne Lamont. And, and other colleagues who have stressed their, their support for Police Scotland. I very much welcome that and the general work that Police Scotland are doing and rightly want to ensure that that is done with the appropriate standards. And I will go on to set out why I believe that is the case. This was our response to an HMIC report that made recommendations for police forces in England and Wales. We brought forward legislation that raised the rank at which authorisation may be made. We required all authorisations to be notified to the Office of Surveillance Commissioners. We are, uh, and we require all deployments to be approved by the Office of Surveillance Commissioners once they reach the 12-month stage. Furthermore, when the 
Pitchford inquiry uh, comes to make its recommendations, we will look very closely at those recommendations and if there are sensible measures we can take in Scotland, then of course we will do so. The deployment of undercover officers is an operational decision for Police Scotland and I know that Police Scotland take these sensitive matters very seriously. Police Scotland has a code of ethics which clearly sets out its core values of integrity, respect, fairness and the importance of human rights. Indeed, the human rights elements of policing were built into the fabric of the service when the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act was passed in 2012, and every constable now makes a solemn declaration when appointed that they will, and I quote, uphold fundamental human rights. The Covert Human Intelligence Sources Code of Practice put in place, if I have further <laughs> latitude... I think improving. we should really come to a conclusion, to be fair. Mr Wheelhouse, please, would you... Um, I will, I will do so. Apologies to Mr Finney. Um, the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Code of Practice put in place by this Parliament under the Regulation of Investigative Powers Scotland Act 2000, which obviously was passed in the time of the Liberal uh, Democrat and Labour administration, also states that any Police Scotland officer deployed, and I quote, as a relevant source, the term used for undercover officers, in Scotland will be required to comply with and uphold the principles and standards of professional behaviour set out in the Police uh, Scotland's Code of Ethics. So we raised the bar in 2012 and the Office of Surveillance Commissioners, the independent judicially led body which oversees undercover policing activity by all UK forces, has extensive powers to address any issues that arise. To date, I understand the Office of Surveillance Commissioners have not raised any issues with either Police Scotland or Scottish Ministers. I have listened very carefully to the arguments put forward by members during this debate, not least from my own colleagues, but across the chamber, and the case made for a separate Scottish inquiry. But uh, we believe at this stage it's important to press the Home Secretary to extend the inquiry to cover activities that may have taken place in Scotland. Uh, and that is the right way forward. <clears throat> Where police forces do not live up to the high standards expected of them, it is only right and proper they should be held to account. But that accountability has to be to the appropriate body. In the case of the allegations made to date, that accountability is clearly to the London Mayor and to the UK Government. Uh, well, I take Mr Finney's uh, point from a sedentary position. But as I indicated previously, the Scottish Government does, however, believe there is a strong case for Lord Justice Pitchford's inquiry to consider the activities of specific metropolitan police units in Scotland, and we await the Home Secretary's response with interest. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Right. Many thanks. Uh, thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.